Welcome to another episode of Chapter Chat. We're live from NEMI. We're going to see a couple of things today. We have some special people with us. As you know, my guest, well, my, he's my, actually my guest and my co-host today, Father David Munoz. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Pretty good. What do you think of, of today's chapter? What was the atmosphere? I don't know because I didn't get to see <laughs> Um There was a lot of excitement on different proposals and so... Uh, you could feel the excitement in the hallways, at least. Yeah, I know we took our, our our the pictures today of the whole all the capitulants with the auxiliary staff and people. It was actually a, a day full of lots of activity. Mm -hmm. um, well, why don't you give us a little bit of the daily report? Sure. Well, today's morning was devoted to further improving the second draft of the chapter document, which was presented by the drafting committee. For this, the capitulants met in linguistic groups. So as you know, there are three groups to the congregate. There are three language groups in the congregation. There's the French, the English, and the Spanish. So they met together and they were they were divided into groups. In the afternoon, there was a plenary uh, assembly. The contributions of the groups that had met in the morning were presented. Then came the final vote of the on the mandates and recommendations of the chapter, which was a marathon with no less than twenty proposals to vote on. The session ended with a surprise video prepared by the Oblate Communication Service, thanking the outgoing general administration for its work and dedication over the past six years. This was followed in the chapel by a prayer service symbolizing the passing from one general administration to the other. Dinner was followed by a briefing on the realities in Sri Lanka and Haiti, prepared by Fathers Eugene Benedict, Roshan Silva, and Eliens Martyr. So that was basically what was going on. Actually, right now they're still in the, the assembly room there mm -hmm. um, presenting on Haiti and, and Sri Lanka. Well, I want to present our special guest live from the beautiful city and town and, and Republic of Texas, Father Frank Santucci. How are you? Good, good. Looking forward to hearing about the uh, the chapter, seeing all these secret things you've been doing over there. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> and how are things down there in San Antonio? Okay. Moving along. Moving along. How's the weather? Is it hot? Is it cold? It's Rain? 90, 92 degrees, I think, at the moment. That's in Fahrenheit for the rest of the world. <laughs> 89 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever that is in um, in Europe speak. It's oh, right. <laughs> for, for the rest many. of the US is cold and we are hot. And no rain for weeks and weeks. Now, for, for many of our viewers, you're really not a stranger. I think most of the Oblate world, many of our laity who are watching as well, they at least know you by name, if not by actually having met you at one time. But uh, Frank, tell us a little bit more about yourself. Uh, you know where you were born, your your journey up to this point. Okay, well, basically born in South Africa of Italian family, as you can see by the surname. Um, became an oblate in 1970 with my first vows, and worked basically in education at in high school education at the novitiate and then doing parish work in south africa and then 13 years in rome doing further studies in the theology of consecrated life and then um, becoming postulator general and they're really getting into the whole animation of the, the charism and going around and doing retreats and um, sessions for formation houses and while I was in Rome, I was also involved in Aix-en-Provence in the uh, Damasinot experience um, in, in the various languages. And then eventually spent seven years full-time in Aix as part mm -hmm. of the team. And then in, 19, no, in 2012, um, Father Fabio Cialdi had been here at Oble School of Theology to perfect his English. And he was the one who moved for a chair of oblate studies. 
um, a chair that never existed anywhere in the in the congregation before. And that took a little while to establish. I came to San Antonio. Sorry, there's a there's an echo. There's a, there's a feedback. Is that better? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. It is now. Um, the the chair needed a benefactor to actually endow it, and so there was no benefactor in sight for the first few years that I was here. It worked out very well, actually, because Joe LaBelle had gone to Aix-en-Provence to take my place. So I ended up being a university teacher for the first time in my life, having to learn how to prepare courses for master's degrees. And so I taught spirituality and some theology courses. And then eventually the Kusenberger family came along, and that's Deacon Robert um, Kusenberger, and his wife, and they um, endowed the chair for us of, that's why it's called the, the Kusenberger Chair of Oblate Studies. And it was actually done to coincide with the last day of the bicentenary celebrations. It was um, launched in Rome on the 24th of January, and on the 25th of January we had the official closing of the centenary year. So that's basically the journey. So I've been in San Antonio for the last 10 years. And um, someone from South Africa was commenting that I have a U.S. flag above my head. Um, that's because I'm now a U.S. citizen. This is home now. So that's the background. You know, some of our viewers might not be familiar with what it means to have an oblate chair. Can you explain a little bit the concept of having a chair of oblate studies? Okay, one of the things that's been very strong in the Oblates, and Pope Pius XI, I think it was, um, said the Oblates are the, the champions, the experts in difficult cases. And so we were very much an action group, doing, 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 establishing ourselves in, I think, up to 70 countries if, at, uh, when we... We were at our biggest expansion. There were 7,000 of us. And so we were activists. And study was not something that was encouraged. Further studies on... And then we didn't know very much about charism and um, even about the founder because he was only beatified in 1975. And as we were told as novices... Um, you know, he, yeah, he founded the missionary congregation, but now you here to be missionaries, get on with learning to be missionaries. So Eugene didn't mean very much to us. And it was only in 1975 when he was beatified that we sort of woke up and we said, he's important to the church. They recognized him as a blessed, as a figure for the church, and we don't know him. And so that's where um, then... Oblate studies really kicked off, and, and particularly, I would say, in, in Europe with the, um, the Association of Oblate Studies and Research, with the Charism Workshop that was held in 76, and then with uh, Marino and Vermicino, the, the scholasticates there who really spearheaded um, Oblate Studies. And again, I mentioned the, the figure of Father Fabio Charity, who has been a major figure in all this. So I also said we didn't know, we didn't use the word charism before because it was only with the Second Vatican Council that Council Fathers got hold of that concept going back to the sources and they recognized that religious life was a charism and they recognized that founders of religious congregations had a charism and through them their religious family had a charism. And so we had 20 years of preparing for the canonization of St. Eugene with um, things like the, um, the Dictionary of Oblate Values, the first time ever that a, something academic had been done on what are the key values of our charism and spirituality. So I could go on forever on all that. But never, ever have we had a serious study of the 
charism at an academic level. We used to have the Association of Oblate Studies and Research, which was the predecessor of the service that we have now in Rome. And they would organize every two years a study week where people were invited to prepare conferences and some magnificent stuff is available in the review V Oblate Life. So what happened was um, it was decided then based at Oblate School of Theology, which is a theological college or university, that we would have a launch of an academic serious study of the charism and of our spirituality. So we sat down, the, I think there were eight of us Oblates, Father Ron Rollheiser and every other Oblate who was on the faculty. And we said, okay, we've got this chair of Oblate Studies. We've got um, tabula rasa, as it were. We've got a white piece of paper. What do we do? How do we go about doing Oblate Studies at an academic level? And that's then when we came up with five courses and a paper. So it's offered, the, the courses that we offer are offered at master's level, at three credit level, which is a pretty deep level, at the Master of Divinity as elective courses. And then we realized that not everyone wants to do the heavy academic stuff. So we started a certificate in Oblate Studies. And that certificate has been a gift to many, many people, including lay people. Um, our first graduates were, uh, we had three, out of the four first graduates that we had last year, three were lay associates, which is beautiful. And, and one is an oblate. And we have many oblates and one other um, a lay person studying at the moment. So that, that's basically how it all started. And the idea then is that it's a service for the whole congregation. It's based at Oblate School of Theology that gives us the academic um, background, the academic support to give a degree. And um, if you're looking at David Munoz on the screen, he's specimen A. He's the very first one to have done the Master in Spirituality in Oblate Studies. And um, so we're very proud of him. Since then, two others have graduated and another one is in the process of doing his thesis. So at the academic level, it has, it has taken. Um, yeah, I think that's... Oh, yeah, so what I did want to say was it's for the whole congregation, which means that we cannot do live conferences, live classes, because I've got students at this moment doing the certificate in India, in Sri Lanka, in uh, Sadara, in South Africa, in Europe, in Canada, and um, no, not in South America at this moment. So we have to do things over time zones. So therefore, it's asynchronous that the material is pre-recorded and the students have to look at it within a week. And then obviously they have to write something, they have to produce something to prove that they are doing the work. Very interesting. Now, uh, I know you gave us a lot about what is going on in you know, the certificate program, the, uh, the different uh, levels, you know, the master's program as well. But can you describe, I know it, but can you describe for some of our viewers what the curriculum kind of looks like? What, what are the main courses? What are the interests and everything that goes into it? Okay, that's easy. The foundational course is St. Eugene de Mazenod. And I do that every semester. Because without that base, you cannot really do the other courses that follow on. And then that's an over, a, a deep view at, at his life, the history of the times, his achievements, his spirituality, his charism, his mission thrust. But then the other four courses are um, deepening that. The second course is Mazenodian spirituality. And again, notice we, not, we didn't call it oblate spirituality, we called it Mazenodian, because our outreach is to the whole Mazenodian family. And so that's been a very interesting course because David was the guinea pig doing this as the student. And so I was busy trying things out on him. 
And then obviously we work together. He is the co-chair, basically, of the chair of Oblate Studies. We're doing it together as a team effort. So um, he's he was on the receiving end, and, and, and a lot of good came from that. So that's Mazenogen Spirituality is the second one. The third one is an interesting one, which is the theology of charisms, founders, and their expression in constitutions and rules. And it's, it's, why I say it's interesting is because I've had students of other religious congregations, and in fact, I offered it for the religious of the United States in an abbreviated form last semester. And that is to, to look at the theology of charism, the theology of a founding figure, and then to look at what is what are constitutions and rules and how can one um, see the charism and the spirituality, that theology, that lived experience, how is that expressed in constitutions and rules? And that came about also because in all the um, animation activity I've been doing over the years, the Oblate Constitutions and Rules are a book that is not much used. And they are so beautiful. The, the more I study our Oblate Charism, the more I love our Constitutions and Rules. They are really spirit-inspired. And they catch the, the spirit of the founder and the spirit of our tradition. So that's the third of the courses. Then we do a theology of oblation as an expression of missionary discipleship. And there we go into the whole scriptural theological background. And then we look at how various figures have lived out the, the oblation. And that's also very interesting to take living figures and, and uh, deceased figures who, who are models of, of having lived that. And then we're blessed to have Father Thomas Klosterkamp on the, um, on the faculty here at OST, and he's a church historian. So he does the course on the development of the Mazenodian missions from 1816 until the present. And being German and being very precise, it's a very clear course and it's an excellent course. And he's a wonderful storyteller, so uh, a lot of very colorful facts come out in the process. So those are the five courses. We've been waiting for um, um, Velasquez to come back um, to finish his doctoral thesis so that he could present a course for us in time on the Oblate mission today. And I hope that Fernando is listening into this because we are waiting for you, Fernando. We've been waiting for far too many years. But I think that you're going to give a beautiful completion to, to what we offer. Then for the certificate, they have to do a research paper on a topic that can be published in Oblatio. Fabio loves me for that. Or in the dictionary of uh, the Oblate Historical Dictionary. For the MA, they have to do an MA thesis. And um, David, I think, could tell us a little bit about the thesis that he wrote. Um, Kleber Lopez has just finished his thesis uh, not too long ago. Um, and there it has to be a contribution to Oblate Studies. And the, uh, the three theses that we've had so far, and the fourth one that Luigi de la Cruz is working on, are very definite contributions. David's one in particular has been a marvelous contribution. Okay. Well, I mean, that. That brings me to my other point. Now I want to know a little bit about how you fit in all this. You already said it. I know, but I want to hear from you. <laughs> so um, my official title, at least in, in the obedience I received, is to be the assistant to the chair of Robert Studies. Um, Frank actually likes to say that we are co-chairs or collaborators. But quite honestly, I don't think both of us fit in the same chair. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it has been a, a collaborative effort in that you know, we, we kind of just bounce things off each other, um, new ideas. You would think that with a charism that's existed 200 and what, 216 years, um, sorry, 207 years, we, that we probably would have learned everything that there is to know already about the founder. But as we go on this journey, we keep discovering new things and applying it to, to the church's reality today. New things continue to develop 
And one of those things is obviously the relationship that we have with with the laity mm -hmm. and how the laity also live that charism, not as as uh, in reference to the oblates, but rather in reference to the founder. So that was really my thesis. It was how does the 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 charism of the founder, the Mazinodian charism, how is it lived by different groups, different associations of laity? And so I think that's part of the major contribution. And one of the things that Frank and I really want to try to make sure that people know is that a lot of these courses are not just for our oblates. Um, it's for anybody who really shares our charism. And that includes so, so many of our lay people. I was uh, actually at the beginning of the chapter, we had our laity here, some of the representatives who were going to present at the chapter. And one of them is our student, Mildred March from from South Africa, she was telling me how she she didn't think that she could go on for another course. Um, and I think one of the big things is people get intimidated when they hear things like academic or they mm -hmm. hear things like a research paper. And so when they when they finally speak to us, we have to find a kind of get them to to think, no, no, you know, don't think about research paper as this huge mega thing. But you know, just an expression of how you live the charism. Mm -hmm. I think that puts people sort of, sort of at ease as well. But even oblates sometimes they hear academic and they they get a little intimidated. Not you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's it's just part of that reality of knowing that the more we learn about the charism, mm -hmm. the more we we know about who Eugene is and how he expressed that charism, mm -hmm. uh, the more enriched we are as well as oblates. And as those who belong to the Mazinodian family. Yeah, that, that's an, I would like, I mean, there's an open question for any of you to, whoever wants to uh, uh, say something. I'm sorry, did you want to say something? Yeah, I want to say something. Um, yes. Just a, a very exciting development um, that I've been, I started it last year to work with formators to do to train them in communicating the oblate charism. So I had Mildred was one of them for last year. So their assignments were to prepare a class on that topic. And Mildred prepared classes for her lay associate group in Johannesburg. She's doing this Mazenodian spirituality. I've just got her second assignment today. So because that worked so well, I spoke to for the Cornelius, and we have a number of formators now specifically doing the certificate, but as formators, so that they have got material that they can hand on. And the, the superior of the International Roman Scholastic for the Gregory is one, and then we have one of his scholastics, Prasad, who's also uh, very, very enthusiastic. And Pras is preparing, he's not ordained yet, but he's preparing classes for pre novitiate So getting ready for that. And that, I think, is something that is very exciting. And I hope, I don't know what your, your chapter document, what our chapter document is going to look like, but I hope that the chair of Oblate Studies and what we have to offer will be a help to help our family to get to know our spirituality, our charism, and to apply it in very real terms in our society today. I think that you know, once the chapter document comes out, hopefully the chair of Oblate Studies and, and the whole team that we have can help to promote some of those activities. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, my question was a little bit along those lines. I wanted to hear a little bit about um, the Macedonian family. How did that originate? How did that come about? I mean, it's something that the chapter is full of it. I mean, everybody's mentioned Macedonian father the other day, Father General Chicho. Um, he mentioned specifically, specifically Macedonian family. I mean, it's a, it's a term that's it's, it's gotten some momentum now, especially out of this chapter. Okay, biblical scholar is Macedonian, not Macedonian. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we get that all the time. Um, I picked up that concept in France when I was involved with with the with Aix en Provence, where they had lay people at all different levels. The French didn't have clear categories like we have in the Anglo-Saxon world, 
And anyone who was in any way connected to the charism of Eugene, they called La Famille Mazenodienne. And I fell in love with that, top, that, that title because it, it focused not on oblate family, which is what we all are because of oblation, but it focused on the charism of the founder is in the center. Um, so that's where the title came from. I, and I've always loved it. And it's been an uphill battle to, uh, to get it promoted. And I even see when we had the OLAC Congress, you know, all the different names that were coming up, which is fine. But the concept, I think, is very, very beautiful. And it is that it's, it's almost, what do you call it, a polyhedron or something where you have all the different, um, an object with different, sh different points at a, dis at a different distance from the center. Um, that's what the Mazenodian family is like. I mean, obviously, the Oblates were the, the firstborn, were the ones who, who spent all these years in formation. Um, so I would say we would be the, the older brothers. But then you have the honorary Oblates, the associates. And now people who have studied, who've done the Oblate studies, who know more about the constitutions and rules, lay people, than the Oblates do. So uh, that's what the Mazenodian family is. And if I can go back to David, his MA thesis was on that. He's now doing his doctoral thesis on a research project that is very exciting on this. And he has been appointed by the province to be the, the head honcho of the Mazenodian family. And they couldn't have chosen a better person because I did the teaching initially. Now I sit at his feet and he teaches me because he knows more about it than I do, which, which is beautiful. So that's the Mazenodian family, Tony. <laughs> now, uh, Frank, speaking about uh, the, all, of, all of this, I mean, why, why do you think it's so important for, for Abbas to really delve into this? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have, like you just said, sometimes we have, uh, lay people who know more about the charism than we do, but the the enthusiasm and the thrust that we've had with with the Oblate Studies program, why is it so important for us as a congregation? Okay, I'm going to answer that in a, in a roundabout way. When I went to Marino for the first time in 1986, I, I met the Focolare movement, which had a big part to play in the Italian province and has subsequently had a big part to play in my life as well. But what struck me there was the living, found, the found, founding figure was alive. Okay, she was Italian, so you had all the Italian exuberance around uh, Chiara. But then I'd also, in South Africa, I'd been involved with the Schoenstatt movement, and Father Kentenich had just died a few years before. And I saw how he was so alive to those sisters, to the whole Schoenstatt movement, the, the whole Schoenstatt family. And that's where I thought to myself, but Eugene was also a founder. He was also a founding figure. He also set things on fire. And, and so what was true of these living founders, and there's many, many more, Santa Gidio community, etc., living founding figures, what's true for them today was true for Eugene then and for all our founding figures. And that's Fabio's thesis was very much the theology of all that. But so why is it important? Because if we want that fire to burn, we've got to burn with that fire ourselves. And I talk a little bit, it's a bit negative, but for the United States, we're crying because we don't have many vocations. We're not going to have any novices. We don't have novices this year. And, and for me, the, the reason for that is they do not see witnessing communities. They, you know, we give them the rule, we say, okay, that's, that's all the theory. But they need to see it lived out. And I believe that it is through the animation that we organize through, not just us. Hey? There's also Aix-en-Provence and there's the office in, in Rome. The three units are now working together to cooperate. But it, it is important that um, we burn with fire and people look and say, wow, we want to be lit with that as well. Not just out of a book. We want to see it. We want to touch it. 
I think that's that's the basis. Uh, so, Frank, if people wanted more information about the Oblate Studies certificate or anything else, where would they go? I know the answer. Yeah, the answer is David himself. He's being all humble now. He did a beautiful website of the of the Kusenberger Chair of Oblate Studies, and um, and you can get to it also through the Omni World website, and there we have all the course offerings. But it's also important to stress that people can just do it for non-academic purposes. They can mm -hmm. do it for enrichment. And if they can't afford it, I mean, the prices are, in U.S. dollars are pretty high. We've got scholarships for people, particularly for people from the, the countries that cannot afford it. Um, the door has to be wide open to whoever wants to, to participate from this. And what... We had a, a scheme that, that sort of only half, um, half came out. And that was to try and have someone in each continent trained up to come and do the MA program. And so Kleber came from Brazil and Julito came from um, the Philippines. And we were hoping to have someone from Anglophone Africa, Francophone Africa, um, and from Asia. Um, but that didn't materialize. But the idea was in two years to train them up to be clones of David Munoz, to be mm -hmm. as North America. Um, so we have trained people who then can train up teams of laity and other oblates who can help to teach novitiate, pre-novitiate, lay associate groups, etc. The sky's the limit, but we need the personnel and the enthusiasm to do it with. And for those of you who are watching us, you can uh, see the the web page on the uh, on the screen at the moment, and it shows you all the necessary things, including um, the Eugene 101 course that we offered last year, and it's totally free. It's online. Um, you can watch the videos; they're about 20 minutes each, and uh, it's uh, I forget now, Frank. It's 16 videos or 20 videos. 16 videos. 16 videos on all on the, the life mission and spirituality of St. Eugene the Massonaut. So uh, feel free to contact either Frank or myself, and we will be happy to give you any of the information for all that. And there you have the Eugene 101 uh, videos that are on that website. Okay. What is the website address? That's a bit more complicated. It's a Google <laughs> Sites. And so uh, it, it, the easiest way to access it is by going to All My World, mm -hmm. but it's... Uh, it's a complicated website. It's like sites.google.com yeah. slash mass. Uh, yeah, you'll, you'll get it from the Omni world. Yeah, it's yeah. much easier just to access it through Omni world. Excellent. If I can also add something there, there's a wealth of material on our Omni world site that the Oblate world doesn't know about. Mm. Um, we've got a library. Paolo Archiati was one of the biggest to relax. He used to scan the books. We've got dozens of books on, um, on Oblate Studies in the library there. We also have the living library of all the news that Shanil puts up every few days on the website. That's the living charism. Plus also, if you're looking at the screen, you've got Eugene de Mazenod speaks to us. Mm -hmm. He's been going now for 12 years. Um, every day I take uh, an extract of the writing of St. Eugene and put a little comment on it. I'd love it to be better known and more widespread, but I don't know how to, to get that. It's in English, French, Spanish, and Polish. If wow. You, and what's important about it for me is that there's a search engine. So you're looking to do some mm -hmm. research. You won't say the poor. You put in the word poor, and all the entries of St. Eugene that deal with the poor come up. I'm on 1846 at the moment, and my prayer is that before that our Lord keeps me healthy and alive to get to 1861, yeah. to have done all the writings of St. Eugene. And That's if my prayer Lord, too. <laughs> David Monius is going to have to be the one to complete the, the project. <laughs> well, but I think, uh, you know, we can be speaking about this for hours, I think. I mean, there's just so much information and so much good things that's going on with the 
Mazenodian family. Mm-hmm. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, but unfortunately, I think our time is about over. So I want to thank Frank. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for everything you do for the whole congregation, the animations that you that you have. I want to thank all of our viewers. You know, we've been getting messages from Vivian Goldstein, Jarek Pashoki, Eleanor Rabnet. So we thank all of them, all of our watchers who have been faithful to us and logging in. Thank you, David, for being my guest and my co-host. So um, I hope you have a wonderful day in San Antonio. And here we're about to close up shop and call it a day. Go to bed. (laughs) Go to bed. Thank you, Frank, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Greetings to the Oblate community down there. Okay. Thanks a lot. Ciao, everyone. Ciao.